word. Father, I ask you in Christ to show yourself to us. Show us how new the life that we live in Christ is. This is your blessing. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I had brother, brother Paul continue to read the, the Sermon on the Mount, which we've been discussing. And if you recall, I, uh, I emphasized the point in the beginning when Jesus opened his mouth and began to declare. Um, and it's found in the beginning of chapter 5, that he saw the crowds and he opened his mouth and he began to teach them. And then we get the Beatitudes. And one of the things we had mentioned is that these blessedness, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. This is the very works that Christ is calling us to do so that the world will see it and glorify our Father who is in heaven. So these are the very things that the world will come to see in the life of the Christian is the poverty in their spirit, their mourning, the meekness, their thirsting and hungering for righteousness, their mercy, their purity in heart, the ability to be peacemakers. This is a gift of God. It's a blessing of God. This is not a thing that we come together and we try to, to muster up. In us, This is not something that we practice. This is a working of God in us. And in verse 10, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. This is the distance, in a sense, that the disciple has from the crowds. And we talked about this, that it's out of the very crowds that Jesus called the disciples. But once a disciple is called, he's no longer just one of the crowds. And there's a, a, a binding. There, there, there is this, this consistency in the crowds and in the disciples. You see it through the book of Acts. Where is the word of God preached? In the midst of crowds. Who get to hear it? The crowds. Sometimes the crowd turns to Peter and said, we're pierced to our hearts. What must we do? And Peter tells them, repent. But later on we see Paul preaching to crowds and the crowds don't do too well with pride. They turn, they turn on Paul. And they beat him. They imprison him. We saw the same thing with Christ. One moment the crowd is saying, let us make him king. They wanted to take him by force and make him king because he multiplied bread. He gave them bread to eat. And at the same moment, later on, the crowd is saying, give us Barabbas. Crucify him. So this is the movement of the crowd. They get to hear it. And out of the crowd, the disciples get called. And we who are called and have heard this call must understand that we're no longer to be moved with the fickleness of the crowd. And there's a great distance. There's a great breach. There's a great division. See, that, that word is, is not a, a word that Christians tend to like. Division. I don't think anybody really likes it. And there's, there, there's a certain mysticism and there's a certain power around unity. Right? The people that built the Tower of Babel, they came together. They were united. And God said, Look, what they want to do, it's impossible. There was a unity that was against God. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they were in unity in rebellion against God. So unity can do much good, and unity can do much evil. No, we have to, it's not just enough to say we just have to come together. Because whatever we come together in is definitive. We can come together and do wrong and do evil. And we can come together to submit to Christ, right? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. There's a great distinction, a great division. And, and this is something that, that's hard, I think, for Christians to see that, or anybody that comes to Christ, what are you saying, that there is a, a division now? There's a distinction and in thinking this, I just want you to open with me to Genesis in chapter 1. And then from Genesis, I want you to go with me to Mark. And I want to, just to keep in mind, because 
When you read the Sermon on the Mount, you have to understand, you, by faith, you have to grasp that this is no mere man that's speaking this. Jesus is the Son of God in the flesh, and He's speaking to the crowds. And there's, there's something wonderful for us to see it, but for those words to fall, and He will not let us flee from the words that He speaks on the Sermon on the Mount. It's the very ending. He says it. If you hear these words of mine and do them, you'll be like a man who built his house upon the rock. And the storms came. Storms will come. And they beat up against it. But because that man heard, because you heard, and you did, and you moved in that faith that comes by hearing of the word of God, and you built your foundation, your house, upon that rock that is Christ Jesus, when the storms come, when the trials come, when the, the chaos of being alive comes, because it will come, if, it, if you're not in the midst of it, you have been through it, and if you have not been through it, you're heading into it. And that repeats its cycle. Doesn't it? It's repetitive. I mean, I get to look at all of you, you know, and then I told you, I have to learn much from you because many of you, you've, you've lived my life. You've lived more than I have. And I know that you can honestly tell me that there is going to be great ups and downs, 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 and ups, and maybe another up, and then another down. And that's constant. And we see it in Scripture. Joseph having wonderful dreams. God revealing to him remarkable things. And then his brothers turning on him. Selling him into slavery. And then he's thrown in a dungeon. But he would not sin against his God. Ups and downs, ups and downs. But the faithfulness of God is constant. And here now we see in Christ, in the flesh, going up to the mountain and opening his mouth. And in Genesis... Verse 3, we have this revelation, this, this amazing behold. And God said, let there be light. And God said it. He declared it. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated See, this is the, the beauty of God's working is that He separates things. He sets things asunder. The Word of God is a double-edged sword. Doesn't the writer of Hebrews tell us that? That it cuts asunder. Psychology cannot separate the makings of man. It can attempt. It attempts to penetrate the psyche of man. And it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And it unveils more things. But it does not, it cannot distinguish between soul and spirit. Spirit and soul. But the Word of God can. It divides spirit. It divides soul. It divides flesh, bone, marrow. It sets everything apart. And here in the very beginning, God said, in the very beginning for us to know, God said, let there be light, and he separated the light, and it was good, and he separated it from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, and this is the first day. Now, on the small group, I mentioned a line that I really enjoy from the Faust, from Goethe. Right? Goethe wrote this play, False, Fa Faust. And I remember I needed Denton to tell me how to pronounce Goethe, because I used to say Goethe, and then he just kind of gave me that look, it's Goethe. I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> and, and there's a beautiful line there. In the very beginning, there are these angelic beings, and they're discussing, they're, they're, they're beholding the glory of God. And, and I wrote it down in Genesis, because it made me think of this. And he says, and each of us uncomprehending is strengthened as we gaze our fill. For all thy works sublime unending retain their first day splendor still. And when I read that line for the first time, just to think that all of God's work retained the splendor of that first day. Now when I hear the Sermon on the Mount, 
and I hear God in the flesh beginning to speak, all of creation recognized that voice because they heard it there in the beginning. And they could, they could track it down. See, we human beings, we fallen beings, our hearts are fickle. We get caught up in movement. We move about. We, we almost come to the point of panic. And some of us do. Right? Anxiety attacks. I remember being a kid. I used to, I'll never forget it. I, used to, I, I didn't know what it was. I used to go up my, in my Caesar's house, my stepfather's house. I used to go up the stairs. I used to sit and assist. And it was like everything was moving around me. And it, it wouldn't stop. And I couldn't tell anybody. I couldn't. I just sat there. And it's just like, it was just like a storm. Pounding, pounding, pounding. And I didn't know what it was. See, that's humanity. The greatest day, right? God forbid, I, I don't know, maybe there are some of you who have buried a child. I don't know. I don't know if I will ever have to bury one of my children. I don't know if my wife is going to have to bury me or I bury her. I don't know. Enough for me is the evil of this day. And I struggle with that. I don't know what is to come. See, Creation knew the voice of its creator. Do we know the voice of our God? Because it's his voice that will still the heart. It's, it's his voice. You know, imagine when he walked on water and Peter, we remember this passage. And Peter says, if it is you, Lord, command me to come to you and I will come. 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 And water became solid ground even for Peter. Now, it's easy for me to understand water becoming solid ground for its creator. But it's a wonder to me that it became solid ground to another creature. And yet, he was taken by it. He walked on solid ground, but it was water. But yet, when he looked to the commotion, to the fickleness. He looked to and fro. And when he heard the wind, and when he heard the waves, it, it, it enveloped him. It, it swallowed him up. But our Lord was still walking on it. And he reached in the waters. And he pulled Peter out. There's no chaos. There's no mess. There's no loud noises that can conquer our Lord. Because God spoke. Because God speaks now. And He will forever speak. So this is the beauty for me when I hear the Sermon on the Mount. That He opened up His mouth to teach them. So turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Blessed assurance, Christ is King. Lord, you are the God of our hearts, the God of our minds. Lord, if you do not open our hearts, if you do not speak to our being, who are we, O oh Lord? Chapter 4 of Mark. Beginning on verse 35, you, you need to understand, Pete, Jesus, as a man in the flesh, he's been working. He's preaching to crowds. If you, if you go home today, and if you set some time apart, the gospel of Mark is the quickest gospel. And it's, you know, it, it's jet-packed. It's, like it's made for my generation, right? We can't focus. <laughs> we need something to explode every single time, right, brother? I mean, it's like if it goes kaboom, we're like, got it. Now, that looks good. Well, Mark is like that, immediately, immediately, immediately. That word, if you read Mark in one sitting, you'll see it. I lost count of how many times. And immediately, Jesus, and immediately. It's, it's a constant thing. It's always action. It's happening. So here, Jesus is preaching to crowds. Crowds are not leaving him alone, not even giving him time to eat. And I, I would ask, is there a tissue? Anybody have a tissue? Anything. But... It's, it's jet-packed. Thank you, brother. 
Oh, Brother Dennis would be happy to see me. Brother Dennis, he's the pastor at Reach. He always preaches with a little... And he, he's going to be here next Sunday with us. So I think it, it, it was... Yeah. I just... Never had a... T- uh, there's always paper mache stuff. So. Immediately. Mark is always constant. Jesus is working in the flesh. In the flesh, in the body. This isn't a supernatural thing. Sometimes we, we think because we're church, we're bound to the supernatural. And yes, we are because it's the natural of God. But things happen in the midst of our messes. We get tired. We get worn out. We're flesh and bone. We make mistakes. We err. And it says here on the beginning of verse 35, on that day, see, this is the day Jesus is working, Jesus is doing much, and you'll see it. He's teaching people the parables. He's just nonstop. It says that on that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. So he, he wants to cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And leaving the crowd. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is in the hearing of the crowd. Here he's leaving the crowd. There's a moment to be in the midst of the crowd. There's a moment to be set apart from the crowd. And there is even a moment when Christ himself leaves the crowd. And here he's leaving the crowd. And look what's beautiful. They took him with them in the boat. So these men laid a hold of Jesus and they took him in the boat. Just as he Imagine talking about God like that. In the flesh. I mean, we're, 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 if, we're, if, we're attempt, if anybody attempts to lay hold of the holiness of God, he dies. But think of, of the beauty of the incarnation, of God becoming flesh and dwelling with us. That they were able to lay hold on him just as he was. In the flesh, before them, tired And yet he's commanding them, let us go over to the other side. And they took him just as he was. And other boats were there with him. And a great windstorm arose. A great windstorm. Now the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains. And the fishermen, right? At least we know that Peter was a fisherman. James, John, right? Remember they were caught... They were accustomed to the movements of these storms. They knew it. It wasn't unheard of. It wasn't something that they didn't quite understand. And that's the truth about our lives. When storms come, when, wind, when things arise, they might catch us off guard, but we know they belong to this life. A great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat. This was the very boat that Jesus was in. So, so this fable that some think that once you come to Christ, everything's going to be all right. right. I used to listen to Bob Marley, so every time I say that, it, it comes back. Everything, we, we think everything's going to be all right. No! It's not going to be all right. Even with Christ in the boat, storms come. And they don't just come. They beat upon the boat. It beats you inwardly, outwardly. Doesn't Paul talk about that? And it beat. And the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling Talk about chaotic moment. Like, I, I'm not taken to boats. I, I've been on a cruise once. And, you know, I didn't like it. Like, I ate way too much. And I, I wouldn't want to get, my wife remembers. I mean, we were newlyweds. I didn't want to get into the jacuzzi. Too many people in one jacuzzi. Just, I just, it was just weird. Right? And, and, and then I found pasta. It's like, and I just never stopped eating. But then I remember I used to go out in the balcony because we got a balcony. And the thing was like eight stories high and I would go out there in the middle of the night 
There's no light. Just the moon is dark. I'm like, Lord, I want to go home. <laughs> like, God forbid. So, I mean, I'm, so I'm not, you know, I, I imagine a little boat and how water filling it. They're in the middle of the, 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 the Sea of Galilee. I mean, it's a mess. But look at verse 38. He was in the stern. He was in the hinder part, in the, in the back part of the boat. It's interesting because it's there that the, there's the direction, right? That's where all the, the parts, see how I don't know anything about boats? That's where all the parts of the boat, a lot of times it helps direction. But he was there in the stern, asleep on a cushion. I am the proud father of five, God willing, soon enough, six, the husband of one woman, praise be to God. And there, and Christy will remember this, when Tiffany was born, right? I fell asleep. There's the woman bearing all the brunt, but I was just too tired. And, and she threw ice on me, and that wouldn't wake me up, right? Like, it couldn't, it wouldn't wake me up. And even now, poor woman, she's, I mean, she's not a poor woman, she's a rich woman, she's married to me, right? Praise be to God. But she's, um, taking care of all these kids. And there are days I get home and she can't wake me up. It's like I pass out. There are moments, I mean, I work out in the sun. I, I, you'll see, I got the perfect farmer's tan. And it, it's, it's just, sometimes our bodies, and the same thing goes for her. There are days I've seen her, she just, we're so tired that our body just, just gives out. When I see this in the flesh of Christ, I rejoice. He was worn out. And we, we read a, a beautiful psalm. I, I read um, a beautiful psalm with the, the congregation this morning when we were in prayer. And it was Psalm 131. In the, in the middle section of verse 2, it says, But I have calmed and quieted my soul. And then the other one says, I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. And I kept thinking, truly Christ did not occupy himself with things too great and too marvelous. Because the very things that he came to do, although to us they're great and marvelous, they were the very things that was set before time existed for the Son of God to do. For him it was not too great, for him it was not too marvelous. It was for that very hour that he came to be nailed upon the cross so that you and I can have life, and that is eternal life, that we can know God, know God in this life, and know him truly as the one and true God. So yes, Christ is asleep because he's safe in the will of the Father, in the midst of his troubles, but also Christ is asleep because he's in the flesh and he's tired. People weren't giving him peace. He had no time to eat. I know that now because we have kids, like, in, like the impatience of children. People look at children and say, oh, they're so cute. No, they're impatient. <laughs> Alithia, my youngest, when she wants water, God forbid if we bring it not. I mean, I want it and I want it now. And Augustine talks this in his confessions. He begins to, to, to cry out about the greed that's in a child to demand nursing when he desires nursing. Oh, but that's a refund. No, that's a demand. That's greed. Although in a child that hasn't come to bear its bloom, I think we can all confess at a moment or another that the flower of pride has bloomed in our lives. He was tired. He fell asleep in the cushion in the midst of a storm that he said, let us go. The disciples were fulfilling the commandment. How many times we move in the very things that God calls us to do and they're the most tempestuous. Now, I'm not talking about if you've made some error, if you have sinned against God, and you are in the midst of the confusion of your own sin. If you are, confess your sin, be forgiven because He's faithful to forgive, and walk in that grace that He has reserved for us now, looking forward to that glory that is to be unveiled to us then. So if you're bound 
in aching and pain and confusion and storms because of your own sin, come out. Repent. Turn from your sin. There has to be a legitimate turning from it. It's not, I repent, I'm not going to do it again, but you continue to flirt with the thing. You continue to abide with the thing. No, no, there must be a sincere turning away from sin. Turn away from it. Leave it behind. Christ died on the cross to nail it to the cross. Now walk in His forgiveness. There's going to be times in that forgiveness that you're going to be thrown in storms. And you might just turn around and feel like as if the Lord is asleep. And here we see him clearly sleeping. And I think young Mark, who's writing here the words of Peter to us. Peter made sure Mark, write down. He was not just asleep, but he was asleep on the cushion. He was asleep on the cushion. I saw it. I was there. And they woke him. And they woke him. Have you ever been abruptly awoken? Awaken, however you word it. Right? It's, what's happening? Like, where am I? Imagine that. See, that's, that's, that's the, the fallen humanity. Caught off guard. It's like we have the, the wind knocked out of us. Right? They awoke him. And, and look at how they awoke him. My kids have waken me up like this. It, 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 right? It's like, it, it, you know, it's, it's like when your wife is expecting, you think you're going to have that moment. Ah, I'm ready. And you're know, like, ah, where do we go here? I mean, this is, this is intense. Water is filling up the boat. All of this is happening. They lay hold of Jesus and says, wake up. And they awoke him and said to him, they woke him up. He's in the flesh. This is no fairy tale. This is a happening in the midst of the Sea of Galilee, in the midst of a storm under the command of the Lord. It's all happening. And they lay hold of Him, waking up and say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Teacher, do you not care See the fickleness of humanity, the, the, our failure. We turn to the Lord, our Creator. Do you not care? What kind of God are you? What kind of God allows such tragedy? Do you not care? I don't know about you, but those screams have come out of me. We see them coming out of a... A, a, a confused and chaotic culture every day that think that they can desire to be God and rule Him. But this isn't the culture. This isn't even the crowns. This is the disciples. In a boat which they lay hold of Him as He was and placed Him in it. Teacher! Do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke. And look at how the Son of God wakes up in the midst of our confusion, in the midst of our doubts, in the midst of our mess. And don't you think for one moment that maybe that mess isn't there because he placed it there. I don't know. That's a mystery that's too wonderful for me and I dare not even try to think too highly of it. I'll leave that in the trusty, bloodied hands of Christ. Look at how he wakes up. And he awoke and rebuked the wind. Do you think the, the wind recognized the voice? And God said, let there be light. And God divided the waters. And he rebuked the wind. And said to the sea, peace, be Still, O oh Lord, cause our hearts to be still. Cause our beings to be still. See, because we have a, 
a, a disgust almost, I dare say, to the Word of God. We're afraid of it. But look at the wind. The wind knew the voice of its creator. It ceased. And there was a great calm. I beg you, brother and sister, hear the voice of God. Trust it. It's his calling. It's his doing. Yes, we, we're going to we're going to make a lot of errors, a lot of mistakes. We're going to sing out of tune, people. And if that's as bad as we're doing, oh, praise be to Jesus. That's, that's good. But we're going to make worse mistakes than that. I've heard of fathers that when their daughters come pregnant home and not knowing who, cast them to the streets. I've heard of men that in thinking themselves to be men, they lock themselves up in a shop or somewhere else and never look at their family. I've heard of sons and daughters who think that their freedom is to rebel against the very ones that care for them much. See, that's our mess. But he awoke and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And listen to the words of Jesus to his disciples. Why are you so afraid? That's not the words to the wind. That's not the words to the sea. To the sea, peace, be still. They don't reflect the image and likeness of God. Only the image and likeness of God can he look upon and talk to it. Oh, Adam, where are you? In the cool of day, God would walk and talk to Adam. And in the cool of day, he called Adam out of his sin. Why are you so afraid. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. Wasn't there a great storm? But that is nothing. Because they were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Brothers and sisters, I'm sharing with you my thoughts and as I'm reading through the Sermon on the Mount. I would ask you to Read through it and hear him who the wind and the sea obey. And it is given to us to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. (sighs) I learned that with my kids. I didn't learn that with my father. I learned that with my children. There's so much that we can learn from him, Bob. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Heavenly Father, I am so grateful to you, Lord. Because you have so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever, anyone, everyone, whosoever will believe in him, oh Lord, 
will have everlasting life, eternal life. This is what you give to us in Christ, Lord. You give us not a portion of yourself, but you give us all of yourself. You don't give us a little bit of forgiveness. See, Lord, when I forgive, I don't know how to forgive fully. But you, Lord, you, you overflow this forgiveness. You forgive fully. And you don't just forgive, you restore. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I thank you for this restoring of my being. Oh, Lord, bless us this day. This is your day to walk now in your word. And, and, and open our ears, oh, Lord, to, to hear your word, to hear your voice in the scriptures and in one another's lives. Let us not condemn, but let us examine ourselves and see whether we are in the faith. Oh Lord, you are our guarantee and our hope. We trust in you, Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm going to ask the church to please stand. Um, as I mentioned, um, Pastor Dennis from Reach, he's going to be joining us next Sunday morning. He's going to be bringing us the word. And it'll be a great joy for you guys to meet Dennis. Pastor Dennis is my brother in faith. He's been a part of my walk, a part of, my, of God molding me. And uh, you guys will get to put a face to the name. And they'll be very good. Amen? May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people. Amen.